The Unshackled Waves, Episode 17. Hello and welcome to the Unshackled Waves podcast. I'm Tim Wilms here for this week's review episode and it is our last podcast episode for 2016 and, oh, well, what a massive year it's been is probably an understatement. Uh, arguably, 2016 has been a tipping point in the battle for Western civilization as the progressive left continued its assaults on our freedoms, culture and heritage. But this was the year when the silent majority finally began to fight back and we saw some tremendous victories throughout the year, which gave us, which is going to give us massive optimism going into 2017. So we will discuss the year that was and of course the most recent news of this week with my guest co-host for this week, uh, contributing editor for The Unshackled, uh, Damien Ferry. Welcome back to the show. Hey everyone and thanks for having me. Yeah, and I should just point out that uh, Damien is phoning into this podcast, which means we're unable to do a video version. So you'll just have to, if you're watch, uh, watching it on YouTube, you'll just have to put up with the Unshackled logo for, for this episode. And we are also recording this, I might add, very late in the night because this was the well, the only time we were both available and I'm always of the attitude that show must go on and if we have to record it late at night, then that's what we'll do. Yeah, that's right, it's for the people in the end. So, I mean, we have to get this show on the road no matter what hour it is. And, um, I mean, my, I myself, personally, I... I'm going on holiday tomorrow morning early, so I mean, um, I thought it would be the best opportunity to um, do my bit for the year in review, and um, and definitely, um, no matter what the situation, we get the show on the road. Yeah, I'm certainly grateful that you're able to yeah c- uh, come on, considering that yeah you've got your <laughs> trip tomorrow morning. Yep, not, not a problem. So we'll get into the first topic uh, for this episode, which is a a current event, uh, which was it broke last uh, week, but we didn't discuss it on last week's podcast. It is the media speculation about a new Australian Conservative Party uh, being formed. This was. Uh, alluded to, there was a couple of articles in The Australian last week speculating that Liberal Senator Cory Bernardi might leave the Liberals in the new year and break away to form his own Conservative Party. Uh, He has set up uh, this website, Australian Conservatives, which is meant to be a hub for uh, for Conservatives in Australia. So far, it's just got an email sign-up form. Um, there's not much uh, content on it. So there are, a lot of people uh, uh, believe that that's going to be a launching pad for a Conservative Party. Um, but we should just uh, point out that this story is still speculation at this stage. Uh, all Cory Bernardi said he's promised a massive 2017. Yeah, I, I've got to agree with that. I mean, I've been predicting this for uh, quite some time now. It's uh, definitely overdue, and um, I think he is the man to do it. He has been flirting with the idea for quite some time, and um, I think a lot of people have gotten to a stage where he's really got to start thinking, well, this year has to be the year, or else I might as well just continue doing what I'm doing and um, and no longer having this speculation overboard because uh, people are starting to get sick of uh, will it happen or will not it happen. Yeah, and I, I would say that uh, of the, the changes that we've seen in 2016, probably Australia is where we've seen the the least amount of changes. I mean, in our federal election, we had two well, left-wing candidates for, for Prime Minister. I mean, Turnbull is... Uh, easily of the left and is unwilling to to fight on the um, important issues. Yeah, I I agree with that. But I think the the main reason why that is the case is Australia isn't in such a bad condition or situation as a lot of the other countries are. 
Um, a lot of the other countries overseas, there's so much poverty at the moment. There's uh, people losing their jobs. I mean, don't get me wrong, we've got it tough here, but it's so much worse overseas. And I think because of that, there's a lot of comfortable people out there that don't really want to see uh, deep into the picture. And, um, I mean, it's like a tribal voting system. And there's a lot of people that have generations of voting the same way and they just don't have the courage to step up and actually think outside the square. Um, so in regards to Bernardi, I think um, he can do something. I think personally, if I was to put it down to it, if uh, what he should do is basically campaign and um, put himself in a position where he can be a contestable party come the New South Wales election and then the federal election of 2019. I think that's where it is. I don't think he should worry about Queensland because One Nation has that all in the bag. I don't think he should worry about any other states. I think he should really focus on New South Wales with the bad government really uh, disaffecting voters that are, are typical conservatives, really going left-wing, very similar to the Turnbull story. So he's got a double header there that he can really put a huge impact through. Yeah, I mean, let's uh, let's talk about, uh, obviously, why um, Cory Bernardi would feel that he needed to, to break away from the Liberal Party, because we always hear oh, Liberal uh, Conservative uh, Party members say, oh, you sh oh, the home for Conservatives is, is in the Liberal Party, you know, you should try and change it from within. But, well, uh, let's start with New South Wales. I mean, the entire uh, state party structure is rigged to favour the the, the left-wing uh, party executives and conservatives are pretty much disenfranchised there. That's right, because, I mean, I've seen it on Four Corners. Tony Abbott went on there and he said it clearly. He said, this system is rigged. you basically got a couple of left-wing power brokers up there calling the shots. They don't want the system fair and square where every member gets a vote to pre-select their candidates. So you're getting Trent Zimmerman in there. You're getting, you know, all these all these candidates with leftist views and I mean that is definitely affecting the party I mean we've heard uh, Kevin Andrews in Victoria he was trying to push for uh, uh, candidates that used to be from uh, Family First and other conservative uh, micro parties uh, into the party to, to basically give it some balance because at the moment you're seeing one-sided views and um, I mean there's a lot of disaffected people especially um, you have to realize from the National Party side of things that a totally uh, different view to uh, the, the inner city liberal um, upper class kind of uh, uh, view. Um, very different type of electorates and um, those kind of people are uh, warm to Tony Abbott and, um, and other figures like that but um, people like Malcolm Turnbull only represent a very small minority of voters and uh, Western Sydney showed how, uh, how basically um, he didn't represent them. He only won two seats Howard had won four and Abbott had won six. So, I mean, um, and that was out of eight, out of eight, eight seats. So, I mean, um, really, when, when you're seeing um, such, such a narrow sort of um, uh, voting class, and, I mean, the problem is he's appealing to people that aren't going to vote for him anyway. They might like him, they might love what he says, but come election time, they're going to vote for their left-wing party. So he really needs to connect to his base. And I don't think he's, he's there to do that because he's there for his own typical agendas. So um, it is time for him to do something. And um, I think he's really just waiting for the right time to strike. Um, I mean, at the moment, both the New South Wales state and the federal Liberal governments are doing very poorly back in the polls. And um, just uh, amongst the feeling in the electorate, I mean, um, it, it really is time that um, in 2017 and especially leading into 2018, that uh, he starts doing something. Yeah, um, yeah, certainly. I mean, uh, it's clear that it, he's at his wit's end with the uh, with the Liber Liberal Party, considering yeah, uh, what's going on. But we should also talk about um, the the challenges that setting up a a new Conservative Party would face. Oh, oh I guess. Uh, it should be described as the challenge of uniting the, the right in Australia because we have uh, numerous uh, 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 right-wing micro-parties in Australia. I can probably name about 10 off the, off the top of my head. I mean, the ones that have 
representatives in federal and state parliaments. There's obviously uh, One Nation, uh, Christian Democrats, Shooters and Fishers, uh, Democratic Labor Party, uh, Liberal Democrats. I mean, it's very uh, fragmented, the, the right in Australia. And so um, Cory Bernardi would obviously have to... Uh, uh, have to try and uh, get all the people, all the people from these various parties behind him, and that would that uh, of convincing convincing a lot of a lot of these people who run the the minor parties to go and join his party. Considering that there's you know a lot of egos involved, people have put in a lot of time and effort to micro parties. That's that, that's going to be a big task for him. I think it's a very big task, but I think that the, the bigger task is for these small parties, these small micro parties, to start putting their country first instead of themselves. Because at the moment, you've got too many egos running little micro parties. I mean, it's, it's really insane how, how things are happening. I mean, you, you, you get people leading these parties and they want the party to be about them and their view. If they want that, then they should become an independent. They really, if they are serious about uh, pushing conservative policy, right-wing agendas, then they need to start forming and merging together. I mean, like you said, there's about a dozen, about a dozen of them. And I mean, the Greens are laughing. I mean, the Greens are over there and they're not getting challenged because there's nobody there that can get their vote, that, that percentage. I mean, One Nation is closest to it and I think they can put themselves in the position to do it. But, I mean, all these other micro-parties are just chewing the vote away. And um, it's all about egos. I mean, um, you've got various parties. I mean, they're, they're basically the social parties, economic and national conservative parties. And they all have the same, more or less, thing in common. So why is it that there's so many divisions? I mean, it just shows how selfish and narrow-minded these people are. Especially, I mean, you've got a, a handful of Christian parties. You could easily say that that's one party that should be just the one rather than, you know, three or four, however there is. You know, you've got a couple that are national conservative uh, parties, like patriotic sort of parties. And, I mean, why is there more, more and more parties getting created? I mean, it's just ridiculous. Yeah, I, I mean, exactly. I mean, the, and the Christian Democrats and the Australian Christians, I mean, that's where it gets. Uh, even more ridiculous. I mean, they were uh, Australian Christians was meant to just operate in Victoria and Western Australia and stay out, and Christian Democrats were meant to stay in New South Wales. But in the last federal elections, Christian Democrats ran candidates in Victoria and Western Australia, and so you even had what was supposed to be one party uh, go into two, and there's already uh, five Christian parties. I mean, it's just ridiculous that there's this this fragmentation. Yeah, it really is. And I mean, um, like, like you mentioned, the problem is that there's so many parties with the same views. And I mean, when these parties are getting 1%, 2% each, they're, they're basically nobodies. I mean, no one takes notice of them. People think, oh yeah, you know, right, right-wing right views just aren't commonplace in Australia because they're of minorities. Whereas when you get the Greens polling 10%, oh wow, that's, you know, a huge vote because they haven't really got much of a challenge. Fair enough, they've got the ham party, the sex party and whatnot on the left, but they're very, very tiny. Whereas you're getting these other, you know, like you said, you get Family First, Christian Democrats, Australian Christians, all basically the same party, but there's three of them, you know, all contesting different states. I mean, that should be one party in itself. And they're all getting, you know, 2% here, 2% there. Then you've got, obviously, um, on the national side, You've got, um, you know, people chewing away at One Nation. You've got, um, you know, Love It or Leave It Party, which only got created about um, a few months ago or whatever by the um, AEC. Why the hell, honestly, would they create a party um, that represents the exact same views as Pauline Hanson? I mean, this is just all about ego. Um, you've got that one there. You've got Rise Up. You've got a couple of others, you know, on, on the right um, that are national, nationalistic patriotic parties. I mean, it's just too many. And um, when you take all to this to account, I mean, more or less, you, you, you get to a stage where people are saying, well, um, they're disunited. And really, I think it takes someone that's big, big enough to be able to merge all these parties and, and these parties to say, well, you know what, our time is now over. We tried and we failed. You know, you, you cannot continue to push something that doesn't work. If you're contesting a couple of elections and you haven't resulted in getting many people in 
and, and a big percentage vote out there, then, you know, you should give it up and say, well, you know, maybe we should uh, try something different because it's just an egotistical uh, uh, view to be able to continue to push something that isn't working. I was uh, pleased to hear um, that Pauline Hanson, she was being interviewed by Miranda Devine uh, last Monday night and she was asked about uh, Cory Bernardi uh, forming forming his own party and she was open to the possibility of of joining uh, for, uh, forces with him for that project. So that so that was uh, uh, very optimistic to to hear that um, that uh, that they would unite, which 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 is what we need. I mean, um, and I think Pauline realizes that uh, One Nation it's still it's still pretty much um, a, a party a party ba- based around her p- personality. It doesn't have uh, too much of a, a structure around it, and so I think she's. She's she's now smart enough to realise that obviously you know Corey's been in a a party machine uh, knows knows the ins and outs of operating a major political party and he could bring uh, a, a large amount of resources and experience which um, uh, she would uh, greatly desire. I think Pauline done something really special when she did that. I mean she basically came out and said you know what. If Corey did a better job at me and wanted the position, he could be the leader. You know, I mean, that that just shows what I'm saying, that you need people there that really care about the country and put those interests of the people first. And, I mean, Pauline really demonstrated that. I mean, it's not about her, it's about the people. And by her saying, look, all these 20 years of hard work and everything... Um, I can basically step aside and have Corey take over if he was to do the same job as me and push the same issues. I mean, that is huge for someone to say that. And it's very, very rare to find someone that's uh, genuine and that isn't all about them and, and, and having that ego. And, I mean, I honestly don't think it will happen because I think that uh, Corey wants uh, something slightly different to One Nation. And I think really the best plan for Corey to do is to really create a party that could become a major party and, and basically uh, shred the Liberals to bits, really. I mean, um, he has the opportunity to do that. I think what he should do with One Nation is keep them close to him and kind of use One Nation the same way that the Labor Party uses the Greens. See, the, the problem with the Liberals is they really have shunned One Nation all these years. I mean, they were really uh, behind getting... Pauline Hanson and One Nation shut down the first time round, and they could have been smart and really used them to their advantage to keep the country basically balanced and on the right the right hand side of politics. And um, I think Bernardi really what he could do is he could uh, establish his own uh, conservative brand. I think he would get out of the base on board. He would also get a few uh, conservative members. You've got to remember that uh, at least, well, nearly half of the Liberal Party members that are in that parliament um, are conservative and that are their former Abbott backers. So they would be on his side. Plus, you've got the Nationals, and the Nationals would definitely step in um, and form a merge or a, a coalition with a Bernardi conservative team rather than a Turnbull one. So that would spill the end to the Turnbull Liberal uh, Liberal Party as we know it. Yeah. I mean, there is, and there was a poll that was released, I think it was earlier this month, which showed that uh, I, th- I think about uh, tw- uh, 20% of uh, Australian voters would vote for a Conservative Party if it was established, which is a, a pretty good starting point. Uh, I, yeah, I mean, like, um, it, it's definitely a great starting point, and um, I think it really shows that um, there is that... Uh, that factor that that people are craving, you know. I mean, um, there they, they really is a, a, a population that is really misrepresented. And I think One Nation has, to a, a, a certain degree, tapped into that. I think it really demonstrates that um, you've got uh, two two factors. You've got the old, old school Labor Party vote that really don't like the direction that the Labor Party have gone in regards to the social, the Marxist policy that they've come out and that they are socially conservative and would back a uh, conservative team. And then you've also got uh, the, the economic and the, and the national conservatives as well uh, that tend to be liberal voters and uh, that would also back them as well. So really it's, it's, a, it's a, a kind of opportunity where you can get people from both uh, the left and the right um, even to come forth and uh, 
basically get the support under this new party banner. And um, he has the name. He has um, a lot of people signed up to his newsletter. He he has a lot of opportunity there, and he just got to ha- he just has to pick his time right, and he has to make sure that he makes the right moves. And I think he can do it. Yeah, I think definitely, and we've seen the benefits of uh, uh, the right uniting with the with the election of of Trump. I mean, all you know, all all different groups on the right uh, united to you know uh, around his candidacy, and he was able to win despite the entire mainstream media and political establishment uh, being against him. Yes, I mean, um, Trump is a great example of that. And, um, I mean, when you see someone like Trump that uh, is, is basically, you know, uh, portrayed as this, you know, really far-right kind of figure, and he's winning states in the Midwest, uh, a blue, blue states, um, I mean, that really says it all. I mean, it really says it all when you are able to have a conservative that uh, goes against the stereotypes of, you know, conservatives being for the rich and, and you know, the left being for the poor, which really, um, I think it really these days is starting to change because it never used to be like that decades ago. Then it started to go down that way with all the neocons that started to infiltrate the right wing. And um, I think now we're starting to see a bit of a shift that it's now more the right that is pushing uh, anti-globalisation, uh, pro-job uh, policies, and um, it's more the left that are, are, are getting behind this uh, globalised, uh, you know, uh, innovation type of world. And um, I think that's really pushing things totally in, in a 180-degree spectrum. I mean, you're getting more people of the working class voting for conservatives, and then you're getting more of the um, of the elites, the upper class over in the cities, uh, tending to vote for uh, left-wing parties. Well, that leads into our second topic, which is our 2016 in review, which I summarised at the beginning of this podcast. And it was basically uh, 2016. It was when, and I've written an article on this, everything changed. It was the progressive left's uh, you know, craziness, their, their, their attempts to destroy Western civilization. Uh, people began to finally push back against that. And we saw key uh, victories, and we, we touched on Donald Trump uh, was elected president of the United States. Uh, uh, there was the triumph of Brexit, and there was also the return of Pauline Hanson. And also, as a side issue, there was also uh, there was also the rise of the new media, uh, new uh, personalities such as uh, Milo Yiannopoulos, and of course the uh, uh, dreaded alt right. So it, w- it was a big year when the, when ordinary people basically said, "No, you know, we're not going to accept this, you know, negative view of you know Western civilization, our history and heritage. We're not going to let you, you know, open up our borders just to everybody and you know control us through uh, political correctness. You know, we, you know, we want to." control our destiny you know we we like the nations that we were and we want to you know return to you know what uh, what made our countries great yeah i think people are really sick of many state politics i mean this is um it's getting worse it's like um a totalitarian kind of uh, a push really i mean um especially amongst the left um yeah, i mean daniel andrews is he's probably Probably the perfect example of the destruction that used uh, the Socialist Republic of, uh, of Melbourne down there in Victoria, and I mean, um, it's just, uh, it's just all these groups of protests. These uh, these people that are, are protesting, and you think, what are they really protesting about? I mean, they these days um, under the left and the progressive push, they really are the ones that are privileged. I mean, it's um, it's no. Uh, no denying that uh, these people are the ones that are controlling everything. And if anything, we're the ones that should be in the streets protesting, but unfortunately we've got jobs to go to. So, I mean, uh, we haven't got the time to do it. Uh, so, uh, I mean, uh, it's uh, it's a funny situation, but quite sad because, I mean, you've got the feminist push, you've got the LGBT community, Black Lives Matter, all these really extreme uh, groups that are, are pushing projects that are just beyond this world, really. I mean, uh, what do you think, Tim? 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, we definitely saw uh, the left at their most crazy this year. I mean, Black Lives Matter, which basically uh, rioted and burnt down cities every time uh, a, a black person was, was shot by the police. And you just sort of uh, were looking at it, you know, saying, you know, what's the point of, you know, all this uh, destructiveness and the fact that, you know, they also, you know, wanted to, like, there was, uh, members of Black Lives Matter were sending out, you know, tweets, you know, kill all, kill all white people. Uh, they were, you know, beating up white people that they saw. It was just, and you know, they were hard. They were not being denounced by uh, the Democratic Party or President Obama. They were just allowed to, you know, uh, basically let loose. I mean, that that was the perfect example of the the left, you know, getting away with, you know, destructiveness. And 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 uh, downright uh, race, uh, racism. Yeah, it was racism. I mean, when you're uh, when you get someone, for instance, that uh, goes out and say, "No, it's not Black Lives Matter, but it's All Lives Matter," and then they're called a racist. I mean, <laughs> this is just extreme, you know. And I mean, I've seen video clips on YouTube where you have Black Lives Matter people uh, speaking in the, in the megaphone, in the mega speaker, and um, and they're saying all white people to the the, the the you know, I mean, and and the funny thing, I mean, well, whether it's funny or really, you know, something to cry about, is that the the people pushing this are white people. I mean, you, you just wouldn't believe it, but there's so many people that you know are on Twitter and on social media, and they go out and protest, and you're thinking, how on earth could a white person go out there and basically, you know? basically protest against themselves, against who they are. You know, I always I, I, I always thought that someone would have respect and, 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 and a bit of a, uh, a pride in who they were, you know, and where they came from. But obviously now it seems to be uh, the, the reverse, you know. You have people out there and, um, and they're, they're basically uh, getting all these uh, black people, all these minority groups revved up because you've got to understand these minority groups are very tiny. But what makes them big and stand out are the white people that push them behind them. And they're making, they're leading the charge, you know. I mean, uh, the Marxist push. When you go and see a Marxist uh, conference, they're all white, you know. You don't see many minorities. You do see the occasional one, but it's mainly a white presence. And, um, I mean, there was also a news article, uh, and I don't remember the lady's name, but a lady came out and said, you know what? I'm not going to have any children because if I have children, they're going to be white. And for that reason, I don't want to have children. I mean, how graceful is that? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, these people, they've well, been completely brainwashed by the, the cultural Marxists who say that, you know, white people are responsible for, you know, everything that's, you know, bad in the world and um, all the uh, poverty uh, uh, is... is is the result of you know what white people have done. So a lot of these people, yeah, they've 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 gone through you know education, uh, you know, with all with all these ideas planted at them. So it's yeah, and it's also the fact that the left is at its core anti anti human as well. And so you know they they want to they want to say that uh, want to believe that you know parts of humanity uh, are bad. Well, of course, and it all suits their agenda, see. I mean, um, the more people they can convince that they're uh, some sort of uh, burden to society, then, I mean, um, it, it's quite easy to see. I mean, a lot of people in the alt-right, you've got Alex Jones and whatnot, that are coming out and they're, they're basically um, showing the hidden agendas behind what these people are trying to achieve. And there's a lot of people, believe it or not, from the left that are pushing a, a deep population uh, of, of society. And, um, I mean... It might sound crazy to a lot of people, but when you really research into it, it does make a lot of sense. And um, this is why they're pushing this climate change or this environmentalism, because by doing so, they are basically making people feel like that they're a burden to the earth, that they're somehow polluting the earth and that they shouldn't be here. And I think that's really dangerous for, you know, people to be, to be put into a position where there's people saying, well, you know, uh, nature or, you know, the, the dog down the street is more important than you, you are. I mean, it's, it's very dangerous. And, I mean, with Black Lives Matter in particular, like you were saying, first off, I mean, um, in regards to the cops, I've seen uh, actual figures, you know, percentages. 
And I've seen that 90% of, of black people are killed by black people, you know? So, I mean, to claim that it's, you know, a white problem is, is just ignorant. And, I mean, you've got the feminist movement. I mean, that's the first sort of uh, movement uh, that the elite created purposely to destroy society back in the 60s. Then it um, went into the LGBT movement. And then it seems like a bit of a racial movement. So it seems like uh, a progression. And um, it's all to create chaos and, and destabilization in the community to get people fighting, get people angry. I mean... Instead of how it used to be back in our grandparents' time where people were happy, they worked hard, you know, there was values in, in the community, that doesn't exist anymore. And, I mean, the elite really have got what they wanted and we're suffering because of it. Yeah, I mean, touching on feminism, I mean, that was another ideology which, you know, basically, uh, you know, put... Uh, pushed uh, political correctness and, uh, you know, attempted to control people. I mean, they pushed the, the false narratives that, you know, there was an epidemic of uh, domestic violence. Uh, there was, we lived in a rape culture, basically that oh, men, or should I say white men, were uh, were evil and, uh, and complement that with, you know, that women were still, you know, discriminated in the workplace with the gender wage gap, just pushing, you know, all this, uh, you know, victim narrative that, oh, it was, you know, women in the West uh, uh, oppressed. I mean, it, it was, it was just, it, it was basically, you could sum it up as just, you know, man hate, man hating and just, you know, ag aggressive totalitarian politics. Yeah, it's, it's reverse sexism. And I mean, um, the, the thing to note is the wage pay gap, is, that, that's basically, you know, a, a falsehood in itself. And it's, I mean, um, the reason why it's a falsehood is uh, that women and men, um, they, they basically tend to uh, go for jobs that are, are different. And uh, women tend to go for, for more low-paying jobs, which they are, you know, um, admin jobs, for instance, uh, you know, um, hospitality work, you know, jobs like that, you know. And, I mean, um, where men and women are paid the same if they are in the same jobs. But because they are going towards different style of jobs, and obviously men are going for jobs that do pay higher, that's why they are saying, well, there's a, page, a pay gap difference, which is false because it's not the case. It's, it's just depending on what job they are going for. And, obviously, you know, you're not going to get many women in, in coal mines, are you? You know, I mean... Um, and, and, and this is the thing, if they want equality so much, why don't they go work in a coal mine and see how they feel, you know, see how they, how they can cope with that. Obviously, men and women are built differently. It's always been that way. They can, uh, there's pros and cons with both genders, and um, that's why they work off each other really great, because one can help in one way, the other can help in another way. By creating a situation where they're competing with each other and there isn't any roles, that creates chaos. I mean, um, it's just a, a destruction of, of who the person is and a confusion, really, when you're getting, you know, gender uh, identity politics coming in, you know, gender confusion over in the classrooms. I mean, it's very sad to see. Yeah, I and, mean, um, you know, yeah. Yeah, that touches on uh, the the third uh, movement w uh, that we mentioned was well the the LGBT lobby and how t totalitarian they've become. I mean, the worst example this year was you know gender fluidity and gender neutrality, where uh, there was oh, seventy one different genders you could choose from, and you you could never assume somebody's gender, and you always had to ask what their preferred pronoun was, and it could be, it wasn't, you know, he or she, it could be Z or Z, and, you know, basically just, you know, trying to, uh, you know, destroy, you know, what what we all thought were, you know, uh, you know gender and identity. Yes, and also as, what it really does is it dumbens down the nation. I mean, it's treating us for fools, and for people to actually um, be able to believe this nonsense, I mean, that, that, that's really striking, like, to see that people actually believe in it. I mean, I understand that it's getting into the education system now, so I kind of understand they're really young people now, but to have people our age and even older people believing in this, I mean, people that got to you know, a half-decent education that didn't teach any of this nonsense. I mean, that's really scary. That uh, something that not only goes against every religion or, uh, or morality sort of uh, viewpoint, but 
also goes against science. I mean, it's DNA. You're either a woman or you're a man. There's only two. There's nothing else. I mean, there's just nothing else in gender. Um, you know, so for people that saying that, uh, you know, they can be whoever they feel, then there's a lot of people then, then, then they say, well, if that's the case, can a 10 year old boy feel like an 18 year old and, um, and, you know, go nightclubbing or can, uh, you know, a seven year old man, uh, feel like a 10 year old and be in a relationship with a 10 year old. See, see what I mean? Like, I mean, if people are basing it on how they feel, then that leads to other equations, you know, it leads to other things. And people then say, well, if that person can do this, then why can't I push the rule here? So as soon as you start bending rules, as soon as you start uh, stretching from reality and, and into fantasy, then all these other problems uh, down the track are going to occur later on. Yeah, I mean, we we, we heard the famous uh, uh, joke, uh, I identify as uh, an attack helicopter, and then there's uh, uh, there was a uh, uh, vox pop done with in university where this guy says, "Oh, what if I, you know, said, you know, I was a woman and like these uni students are like, oh, you know, I'd say that was that that was fine. I mean, it's just gotten to the insane level, and we'll we'll touch on probably uh, the the last." Uh, uh, last uh, assault that the the left uh, tried this year, which was open borders. Well, it probably started uh, prior to uh, 2016 with the uh, European migrant crisis, where uh, European nations led by uh, German Chancellor Angela Merkel just decided to let anyone in from the Middle East to claim they were a refugee or asylum seeker. And in the United States, so uh, decades of loose border control on the southern border had, had led to a uh, massive influx of immigration from uh, the third world, from not just Mexico, but other Latin American countries. And we, we were seeing you know the the crime rates increase in in Europe and and uh, parts of the parts of the United States with large migrant populations and of course we saw uh, terrorist attack after terrorist attack I mean Europe was having pretty much a terrorist attack uh, every week uh, I mean uh, probably about uh, was it June there was the there was the Nice attack and then there was. Uh, but then there was also the Orlando massacre. I mean, yeah, it, it was really scary at, at at one point this year. It's really scary, and it just proves that our leaders are gutless to actually do anything about it. I mean, what they should be doing is treating our country like a house, like their own home. Would they let people, foreigners, come into their home and destroy it? I mean, they wouldn't, would they? So why would they let people come into their country and slowly destroy the country. I mean, when it comes to borders, there's two problems with borders. The first is the cultural impacts, and then the second is the economical impacts. Now, I've seen people like One Nation, Trump, I think they've done a really good job in uh, basically arguing the fact of the cultural impacts, that uh, these people just don't agree with our values, and um, that they're here basically to uh, push their viewpoint. And, I mean, also um, the fact that many Middle Eastern countries aren't taking these people in and instead the European ones are. And um, they're just uh, basically with different viewpoints, different values, and it just leads to a destruction and a chaotic environment. Um, the second point that isn't touched on as much, but I think this is where a, uh, a mainstream party needs to step in. I think a typical you know, mainstream conservative party someone like Bernardi to push this point, leave the, uh, the cultural impacts and everything to, to Hanson and whatnot and uh, focus on these because these are very important as well. The economic impacts is that these people are doing two things. Either they are coming here and they are getting into work and therefore they're stealing Aussie jobs that um, aren't there in the first place which makes it even harder for people that are unemployed to find work because they're competing with a lot more people or they are going on to welfare and they're just flooding and rotting our welfare system. I mean, this leads to massive problems. We've already got an unemployment rate, which is high enough. So is it really a good idea to continue to bring people from overseas and uh, just continue to make it rise? I mean, this is... When it comes to immigration, you only bring people over here if it's a complete 
necessity. I mean, this is uh, like the old days with the uh, the, the the snowy hydro scheme, and um, when all the Europeans came here, that's because the jobs were here, they were available, and there was lots of jobs, and that's why people came here to work, and they were straight into work. But now we're not in that environment. We're not in the environment where anyone can just get a job off the top of the bat, you know? I mean, there's a lot of people that can and they get offered work. I've done an article on it not long ago that uh, 30,000 plus people are rejecting work that Centrelink actually offer them. I mean, 30,000 people rejecting it because it doesn't meet their standards, you know, because their standards are so high or they just can't be bothered. Yet we continue to bring more and more of these people that are going to do the exact same thing. So it leads us into a, a position where the taxpayer is fitting the bill and uh, the person that is looking for a job is competing with a lot more people. Yeah, and I'm certainly of the view that an immigration policy of any country, it should be to benefit the people who already live in that country. I mean, are you the you know prime minister or president of this country, or are you the you know prime minister and president for everyone in the world? I mean, you know that we should just you know have open borders and you know any, anybody should be allowed in anywhere, and the people get no say. I mean, that's pretty much a, a globalist position where it's where it's basically you know you um, in your community don't have don't have, don't have any rights you've got to you know accept, you've got to accept what what we tell you and you know if you're going to have that attitude to immigration you may as well not just not have countries well that's their plan I think really um, I mean that's their hidden sort of agenda and, I mean, it's coming out slowly and slowly when you're getting leading figures coming out and talking about this. And it's starting to get exposed. And I think they're in a position where they're going to have to start uh, continuing to, to have uh, different options in their plans just to sort of uh, try and uh, trick us or get us on the wrong, on the wrong path because, um, I mean, it continues going out. And uh, just like you said, I mean, we're in a position that we're vulnerable. If anyone... Uh, is looking for a job here in Australia and, uh, and a position comes up, then they should automatically be the one chosen. We shouldn't go for people overseas when there's people here that can do their job. You should only go for someone overseas if they are specialised in a, in a field when nobody here has the, that particular qualification to do that work. Then it's fine, and I'm, I think most people would agree with that. But, I mean, to, to be able to uh, continue to have this open border sort of arrangement, I mean, it really is shafting the, the people that have worked their ass off all their lives here in Australia. And um, people have just had enough of it. Yeah, exactly. And we've done a, a good summary there on well, the, what the progressive left uh, did, uh, did this year and their various assaults. But it obviously was... that uh, That was... An important issue, but the the main the main development was that the fight back uh, begun against uh, against the progressive left, and it's worth uh, asking the question why did that happen? And I think that the main reason that happened was not just because the left was getting more and more insane with with what they were pushing and their destructiveness was on full display, but also because of the rise of the, the new media, the internet media, and basically that the mainstream media was was totally discredited uh, this year because, you know, if people wanted to find out uh, the truth about what, what what was going on. They uh, they went to these new media sites, and I think that was that that's what helped Brexit happen, and that's what helped uh, Trump get elected as well. I think it's empowering people because now people have a um, an opportunity where they can get a different view. I mean, it really um, it, it's a really uh, liberating uh, a feeling to to be able to uh, go online and uh, get um, a position or a view that's different to what you see on TV because that's where most people are getting their news from. So um, for people to be able to go on and, um, and, and get these views that, that counter the mainstream argument, um, and, I mean, we aim to do that. I mean, that, that's what we aim to do. We aim to give that um, opinion that uh, is shut down because um, they don't believe in a free society, a free speech, and um, and basically want all of the media to push one view, one one point. And we're not doing that. We're not falling for it. And we're definitely standing up and we're writing our piece. And people are starting to think, 
Well, you know what? I actually agree with that. A lot of people are going on to these articles, onto these podcasts, and they're listening and they're, they're reading and they're saying, wow, you know, I never thought of that or I did think of that, but I don't feel like the news or, or, or the media is actually um, saying what I'm thinking, you know. They're pushing something that I totally disagree with. Um, and here I, I, I have a... Um, I, I, I now have an outlet that... Um, somewhat uh, has a, the same viewpoint as I do. So people are, are very happy with it. And uh, it just gives a balance, which is what we need. And, I mean, they're going to continue to attack us. They're going to continue calling us fake. But there's no fake more than men. You know, I mean, they are fakers for fakes because it's all programmed. The people, yes, they are, are told what to say by the bosses, by the big elite. And uh, whereas us, we're basically saying what we think. I mean, you say something you believe in, I say something I believe in, and you're getting people views. You're not getting views of big corporates, of CEOs, of, of these uh, globalists that um, are all, you know, people have the idea that oh, if they watch ABC, they watch Channel 10, they watch Win, you know, 7, they're all going to get, you know, slightly different, but they don't. It's all the same. You know, it's designed to create a, uh, a spectrum to make people think that they are basically, uh, you know, getting different viewpoints. But if you actually sit down and watch the news, it is exactly the same position. And we're there to, so we defeat that aspect, and that we do provide the balance. Yeah, and of course, the the mainstream media reaction to you know people turning away from them and going to the new media is of course to decry it as uh, fake news, which we've discussed quite a bit on this podcast, and I've always. Uh, describe you know fake news. It's either news that uh, the uh, the mainstream and elites you know don't don't want reported on, or it's news that uh, that somebody disagree, disagrees with. Which is, I mean, uh, it's even even though they're now you know saying don't listen to like it, it's too late. People have have now woken up. They're, they're not listening to the mainstream news anymore. And I think it's going to be, I mean, there's, you know, uh, attempts by, by the left to try and censor or control the, the, the new media and the internet. But I think it's, it's too late now. People, people have access to the truth. I don't, I don't think uh, there's, a, there's any going back for, for the progressive left with, with the amount of information that's now, now available. Yeah, I think they will continue to attack it. I think they will try and do what they can to censor it, um, which basically is, you know, uh, the communist kind of uh, <laughs> communist kind of like um, agenda. But um, I mean, we're still going to be there. We're, we're going to do what we can, um, even if they, uh, you know, continue to have Zuckerberg, you know, banning us on Facebook for uh, sharing our post. Um, we'll find other ways. You know, we'll uh, we'll always be there. There's plenty of ways to get your point across. We've got our own websites, you know, um, and the more and more people are, are starting to, um, to to get involved and to wake up to what's going on, um, I think um, they're going to come up with some other plans, you know, because the, their plans at the moment aren't working and um, with the rise of many leading figures in the media now, with Alex Jones, with, you know, um, with uh, Mark Dice and um, right, there's but... many of them out there, you know, it's it's great to see. So we might move on to our final topic now, which is uh, predictions for 2017 or what we'd like to, to see happen. And of course, we'll start with the, the big question, which is, will Trump succeed and what challenges will he face? Now, I'm of the opinion that he must fulfill his promises. I mean, there is a lot of expectations on him. I think that he must build the border wall. He must you know, stop immigration from uh, countries with the history of Islamic extremism. He must repeal Obamacare. He, uh, he must uh, tear up the, the Paris Climate Agreement and, of course, must cut taxes and, and regulations. And, of course, even though he's got a Republican uh, House and Senate, I mean, there's still a lot of establishment Republicans and neoconservatives who don't like him and will try to thwart him every step of the way. Yeah, the neocons are going to try and be there to destroy him. But I think um, really it's, it's for him to kind of push his agenda. I mean, um, and basically steer it in a way that uh, makes it realise to these people that it's in their benefit as well as his, you know, that, that um, it really benefits their uh, kind of ideology or their viewpoint. 
I mean, I think, um, like you said, he has to build a wall. There's no denying this. I don't think he'll be able to walk away from that. That would be the first thing he has to do. Um, he definitely has to um, be tough on borders and national security. Um, I think it will be good um, to get past a lot of the neocons, but I think those particular issues, um, I, I don't think it would be a, a problem getting through because it would just destroy them. I mean, to, to campaign as hard as he did on those, especially on the wall, I mean, you can't really backtrack on such an issue like that. It, that was what defined him, what defined his campaign. So that's something that's very important. Um, on other predictions, obviously, of course, there's um, there's going to be more European elections coming up. I think Le Pen has a good chance. I think uh, Gert Wilders has a good chance. And, um, I mean, Merkel at the, at the moment is really on a knife edge. So um, she could be another one to fall. Yeah, I mean, because, there's, I mean the, there's the alternative yeah, as a, for as a German party. Leader. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as a conservative leader, I mean, she's been terrible. <laughs> I mean, for someone to let that many people in, and it's just um, led to a lot of the terrorist attacks we've seen. So um, I think that's be something that's going to be influential. I think here in Australia, there's going to be something that's going to happen. Um, certainly, I think it would be wise to do it later on in the year rather than early. I think it would be um, it would be best um, for Bernardi if he was to try something to do it late 2017. Um, that way, it's really just a year or so over till the next election. Um, he doesn't want to do it um, too too quick or too soon because then it's going to be a good two-year gap. And I think it's better to be about a year or so before an election so he can really be focused and make a hard impact. Yeah. I mean, uh, Australia is definitely, I think, where we're, we're lagging behind for the, the rest of the Western world in, in this fight back. And, yeah, we've definitely touched on tonight uh, what needs to what needs to happen in, in that regard. And uh, probably the... The left, they're, they're definitely still in charge in Australia. I mean, we've still got the Australian Human Rights Commission, uh, you know, uh, uh, handling all these uh, ridiculous 18C cases and telling us how, you know, horrible and racist we all are. We have, of course, well, a worst, a worst example of um, uh, left pushing their agenda is well, in Victoria with the, the uh, full blown safe schools program and respectful relationships. Uh, I mean, yeah, they're still, they're, st they're still in charge of our institutions here in Australia. So I think that uh, uh, Australia should, uh, definitely ne needs, to, needs to catch up in this regard. Yep, definitely. I mean, we have to get out there. We have to voice our concerns and make it uh, basically prove to them that uh, we are the silent majority and that we're not going to take it anymore. We've got the people, we've got the numbers, but we haven't got the loud voices that the left uh, always uh, seem to achieve, uh, achieving when it comes to the, the degree of uh, loudness and the degree of their protest that uh, aims to try and, or their activism, like they like to be called, you know, rather than their extremism. Um, so we have to get out there, we have to really push our views in a civilised manner, not a violent manner that the left choose to do. And we have to get on our social media and basically get people on board and um, get them to read a different viewpoint because as soon as people start seeing something different, they start to think and they start to question, well, you know, am I seeing the right thing when I'm watching the news? You know, am I reading the right article when I'm reading, you know, the mainstream? So they're really starting to wake up to themselves and the more people we get on board, the better for this nation. Yeah, and that's one of the main reasons why we started the Unshackled here in Australia is because we saw there was a, uh, we saw what was happening in uh, North America and in Europe as well, and felt that that sort of voice were, was missing in Australia. So we've been going for uh, a few months now, and we've been pleased with the progress that uh, we've made, and we certainly hope that 2017 is when we can uh, begin to make. Uh, significant inroads and uh, help help take back uh, Australia and rest restore you know pride in our nation and what made it great. That's right. We've done so well uh, at a grassroots level to build this, and we need to continue pushing hard. And I mean, with a lot of good things coming up. Um, we've got, of course, the the unshackled uh, ten awards that we're going to be um, handing out the ten awards of the year. Uh, so um, we urge people to get on there and um, and vote on our website. That uh, we've got two up. We're going to have more coming up as well. And on Australia Day, we're going to be uh, in introducing basically or announcing the winners. 
um, of these awards. So um, it's going to be great to get people on board and um, to get people um, basically contribute um, to the discussion. And I mean, we're seeing, you know, obviously the Australian of the Year Award tends to be a uh, um, a left wing uh, oh, social justice war every year. You know? <laughs> We're, we're, we're hoping, though, we can... Uh, we've, we've also had our campaign to uh, win Sonia Kruger the Gold Logie, so we hope that uh, when uh, when the nominees are revealed that uh, we've made a difference. That's all right. <laughs> uh, so uh, that's it for us today. So thank you, Damien, for coming back and being the co-host for this episode. Not a problem. I was, uh, had a great time, and uh, thanks for everybody uh, for listening in. Yep. And uh, before we go, um, of course, we uh, Damien touched on the Unshackled Award, so make sure that you vote in the the relevant categories. All of them will be will be up soon, and so we hope there still be plenty of time to vote before Australia Day. Uh, don't forget, you can also support uh, our work. Uh, uh, via where you can become a patron on Patreon or you can donate via PayPal or you can also apply to advertise your business on this podcast or the website so make sure you check out the support section and also don't forget to subscribe to the show on you can do it on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio and I've also view video versions on YouTube and of course don't forget to check out the unshackled.net for all the latest news. So thanks once again for listening. Have a happy new year and we'll see you in 2017.